it has been a while. I am back. Today I'm bringing you the Coke Zero breakdown tutorial. Going to take you through the whole process of how this was made from scratch to finish. Um, not going to do everything manually. I'm just going to take you through the process and the concepts of how to create this yourself. Otherwise, we'll be making a week long tutorial and that is not a good idea. So. I have been gone for a while. Uh, I got hired for to work for an advertising agency, so I've been working for them for a month. Hectic, hectic stuff. Learned a lot um, in terms of optimization, um, speeding up your workflow, render optimization, stuff like that. Um, I work 10 times faster now, and my render times are probably 10, 20 to 30 times faster as well. But in this tutorial, I hope to teach you some of the tricks I've learned along the way. Um, I am... So the contract ended end of last month and um, I've been finding more work from other companies and stuff. Um, it's quite fun. A lot of freelance work, which is exciting. Um, but yeah, I tried to make this tutorial uh, a few days ago and right before posting it, I realized the audio and video out of sync. So that was an issue. I tried to fix it, couldn't fix it. So I'm making it again. Um, last one took around an hour long. So I'm assuming this will take maybe 50 minutes to an hour long tutorial, but I'm going to go through it very slow. Not going to rush anything, go through all the details. Um, it's quite a simple project though, but there is quite a lot to go through. If you want to download this project, you can get it at patreon.com slash author whitehead. And you can download all my project files, including this one, and you can go along with it or just use it for your own purposes and do whatever you want with that. You can follow me on Instagram.com slash author visuals. Um, I'm very up to date on there, always posting stuff. Um, my day to day is whenever I'm like going hiking or I have something to say or posting 3D stuff there, real life stuff there, I'm very active on that. And if you want, you can also follow me on Facebook.com slash author author visuals as well and I do post all my 3D stuff there as well which is quite exciting. So yeah I don't want to spend this whole tutorial telling you what I've been up to uh, even though it's quite exciting I'll sort of leave that for another video or maybe a live stream um, I'll sort of show you what I've been up to but I really want to dive into the de details for the people that um, don't really care. So we are inside a Premiere project, project right now. Um, originally, I was going to do this all in After Effects, but then I realized that the playback would be slow and uh, I just thought it'd be easier to organize it inside Premiere Pro. Uh, so originally, I was going to have one long composition that was that would be done in After Effects, but I realized if I wanted to change one frame here, I'd have to reset the whole thing. Um, we'll re-render the preview of the whole thing and that would just take way too long. So instead, I decided to divide it up into chunks again. So now if I want to change this scene, um, I just have to re-render this section here instead of re-rendering the whole thing. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different scenes. And the last one is just text. So we'll say six different scenes that I've used. Um, and once again, we're starting off with some audio. So this audio I got off Audio Jungle. Um, originally, I didn't buy it. <laughs> I ended up buying it um, in t uh, for the purpose of the tutorial, but originally I just, the audio jungle um, thingy comes on like here where they say audio jungle. Um, so I just cut it all the way up to here and I was like, oh, that's perfect. I can just use this. So I don't have to pay for it, but um, I ended up paying for it for the tutorial, but it would make it a bit nicer. Um, so I do have the rights and stuff for that now, um, but originally I didn't pay for it. And once again, I just synced up all the scenes and stuff to the beats here. So. And then here. So pretty much whenever uh, whenever the, the drum hits, um, it'll change the scene. Just generally, um, your scenes look better if they work to the music. Not the best choice in terms of scene picking and animation, but once again, it's just a can. So there's not really that much variety you can do in terms of how many angles you can show on can off. Um, a couple of times it's just the same angle it's just a bit closer like you'll see here um so far my favorite is this one um this one was actually the first one i made um and then the whole scene is pretty much just built around this i try to do a bit of real flow here but the liquids didn't turn out as great as i hoped but at the same time i didn't want to spend weeks on this i only spent a couple of days on this project 
and then I realized it's going so fast, I decided to switch to 4K footage. And then that took another two or three days just trying to um, deal with that. Uh, my CPU is not strong enough to handle that at the moment. Um, so yeah, it was quite slow to work with, but I wasn't rushing it as, um, as well. So yeah, so I guess we'll start off. So I told you I've got a bunch of scenes here and then they also correlated to this After Effects project here. So if I go and turn off Animatic 8, then Animatic 8 here should turn off. It is 4K footage, so the playback will be a bit slow. Oh, I meant to do this. Sorry, turn it off like this. Let this thing just uh, update quickly. Save it and then check, see. So now it's, now it's black, but if I go and turn this on, solo this, turn these back on as well, save it, turn on there. So I generally like to work in this uh, workflow um, because it gives me live feedback in Premiere Pro and I can always just go render effects in and out and get a nice live preview of the whole thing. Whereas in After Effects, you have all this caching issues and stuff like that. And just, it's a lot easier to work through this method. Um, I name all my different scenes uh, animatics and then they all have numbers one to how many scenes I have. Um, and that's why you'll see it's any one, any five, any eight. These are just different scenes with different animations. Um, I don't really favor any scenes in terms of numbering and stuff. Just the next scene that um, has an animation, it'll have the next number. And then sometimes I'll just shuffle them around and that's why you'll see it's seven here, one there, stuff like that. So technically animatic one is the first animation I had. Animatic two is the second one I had, then three, four is not here anymore, five, six is not there anymore, seven, and then eight. So technically this is technically this is the first scene I've made for the for the actual project and this is the last one. Um, and then this one is just text, so I guess that doesn't even count. But that's the whole process of organizing the whole project and stuff like that. Three different compositions. These are just for Instagram versions. Here's a story version, actual video version, which is just different crops. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So I guess we'll get into Cinema 4D and just start from the beginning um, to how it's built up from the start. So here we'll pick Animatic 2 because I feel like that's the best. It's my favorite scene. So let's we'll start off with that. And we'll start off with the modeling of everything. So first you can see this the scene is basically just a plane for the background and that's pretty much it and then there's a can and then there's droplets and then there's lighting we'll start off with a can here so the can's pretty simple to do i'm not going to go and model this out for you because you can see i'll show you how polygons are made if you have any basic knowledge on modeling you can make this this is literally just a cylinder with a bunch of subdivisions and around so any basic knowledge of modeling and you could easily make this can. Uh, you can see that I have paid very close attention to the detail. Uh, I actually had real, I went and bought like actual cans, different types and stuff I like got to um, make sure that I got the detail right and have real life references. This isn't a specific can, this is almost like a blend of different cans in a way. So yeah, that's the body and then the top here we take a look at these. This is a slightly bit, this is a bit more complicated, but um, it's still achievable, even with basic um, modeling knowledge. So we'll start, so here you'll see that there's an error because here it's quite close together. And then it's sort of, as it comes out here, it stretches out. That just has to do with Cinema 4D annoying me. Sometimes my cylinders um, will have different width, and depth, which is really annoying. Don't know why they do that, but whenever I'm working with cylinders and stuff, sometimes I'll see that the actual length this way and the length this way is not even, and it really messes up my geometry. So in this case, it wasn't that big of a deal. You won't really notice it, um, but it does still get on my nerves. Um, but yeah, so I'll start off with this end here. So here you can see it comes down like this like that and then this isn't a very very good angle maybe I should drop this fong angle so you can sort of see it better let's drop that down to zero 
Or is that the wrong object? This one. Let's drop this down to zero. Okay, now you can see it a tiny bit better. So here's just some planes. Extrude it out like this. And then you come around the top here. Let's just turn this back on. And that's what the top looks like. Um, so this part here, I pretty much just took the cylinder, extruded it in. It's good if you have a real uh, reference here. Like here I have a reference for sizing and stuff like that. If you have an actual reference of a can lid, you can just pop it here and then sort of just model it towards that. Um, so yeah, I just I just took the cylinder here. I, I pushed the points in to get this um, ovalish shape. Um, it's almost like a pear. And then I just extruded in the even more so this part's a tiny bit more tricky but it is quite it is kind of simple it was more tricky to figure out than actually model it um but once you smooth it you'll see that's the sort of shape that you get there's different types of cans and stuff so um it doesn't have to be exact um exact science but yeah i'm just just giving you guys a nice view in case you just want to go copy this um or you could just download the actual project file on my Patreon page and then you'll get all this um, for free for, yeah, you know, you'll just get all these um, actual objects and stuff so you don't have to do it. But, you know, here's some close up looks here. You'll see that I have some lines here going. Um, and the lines just basically, <laughs> I just say we have some lines here going. So these, these, these lines that are closer together, they basically just to help harden out the edges, as you can see there. That's pretty much it. So that's the top lid. Then there's the cap. And oh, sorry, there's a fly flying in my face. So this cap here is pretty much just a cube. Um, so if you think of it like this is just one big cube, like so. Then I subdivided a line in the middle. Then I took the two faces on each side. So these are the two faces on each side of the cube. Extruded them in to get this point here. Just cut a hole in both. So these are the two holes on the two halves of the cube. And then here you can just take this face and extrude it in there, extrude it there, and then extrude it there. Um, and that's pretty much how you do that. And then there's just a line going across here just to add some support there. So now if I go and smooth this, that's the sort of shape that you get. But it's pretty much just a cube um, with a bit of modeling. And here it's just a cylinder with a fillet on it. And that's pretty much the modeling of the can. It's quite basic. Um, just uh, literally just one, two, two cylinders and a cube and then this third cylinder here which isn't even involving modeling. But yeah, so that's the whole modeling side of it. Um, I guess we, okay, we'll do droplets next. So droplets, this is actually very simple to do but at the same time it can be a bit tricky to get the um, proportions, right? I still didn't get it perfect, but for me it was close enough that um, if a client did see, or if a potential client did see the video, um, he would be happy enough with the way they looked. And if he really wanted for his actual product, um, he'll know that I'll be able to just adjust the drops to uh, exactly what he wants. So here you'll see I have a variation of five different droplets. Um, I wish I did these a bit better, um, but at the same time, I was sort of wasn't really worrying too much about the small details. Um, but yes, yeah, so five different versions. You put them inside of a cloner, and then you want to create a collider for your actual object, which is basically just a surface to clone the um, actual stuff on. So here's the can, and then obviously we don't want drops under the can; it's a waste. So we just delete at the bottom and this is where the drops will be cloned onto um, so yeah so you put them inside a cloner <coughs> like so and then put your collider there and then set an uh, account set a actual amount of them sorry or well, which I guess it's called account as well and then here I just have a random effector I don't know why these things aren't actually affecting anything. I'm going to push apart. Okay, so I have a random effector just to 
add some variation to the sizes and some slight rotation. Um, here you can see it's just 10 degrees, very slight rotation and some scaling. And then the push apart here is just to make sure that there's aren't uh, any drops that are too close together like this one. And it also spreads them out a lot more. So if I go and solo these, you can see the push apart effect is sort of, here you can see there's drops going inside of each other and stuff there as well. Um, there they're too close, push apart effect, it just spreads them out more evenly and gets rid of the ones that are too close. You don't want to have um, two drops that look like they're intersecting, that just won't look real. Um, so I decided to do that. And then I also have a clone of just much smaller versions of the drops, basically the same thing, it's just scaled down a lot smaller which we'll see once my Sim 40 stops freezing here. Cool, so here you can see a lot of drops going. Um, but yeah, so what, what I did is I went and merged all of these up into one object and I kept a save of the cloner. That just speeds up your actual viewport here. So now it's a lot more snappy. Um, and also leaves room for animation, which we'll get into soon. So that's the modeling of the droplets. As you can see, they're just spheres. So I don't need to go and tell you how to make that, but <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so we'll get into texturing now. So let's bring, let's solo this can here and bring up our live viewer. I'm getting a PC upgrade soon. I'm excited. Um, okay, so let's go and rotate this HDRI. I guess that's a good enough angle, like so. Okay, so we'll start off with the texturing of the can now. I feel like I'm forgetting something, so I'm being a bit slow right now because I really do feel like I'm missing something. Anyways, okay, so start off with this metal here. Um, this one's quite simple, just a glossy material, uh, index of eight, no diffuse because it's metal. Um, and then we have some polygon metal textures in our specular, in our roughness or our glossiness, and then a normal map as well. And then here I just have some color correction to, uh, adjust the actual metal. So if I go and store a render buffer here, you'll see what that does. So here you can see this is a bit too smooth, a bit too soft, rough. I don't even know how to say, but I just like this one a lot better. This one just felt a lot more metally, a lot more cold. Um, and I just had some references to look at and I was like, this looks a lot better and a lot more real than that. So this almost looks fake. So that's why I added that color correction just to help with that. And then there's the graphic. We'll get into that now. The floor is just a diffuse material. Um, pretty much it. I don't even know I have roughness here, but it's just a black diffuse material. Very slightly black. It's actually at 1%. If it was completely black, no, excuse me. If it was completely black, um, the lighting wouldn't catch on the floor and you wouldn't see any shadows and stuff. So I had to be on 1% just so we could actually see them. And that's pretty much it in terms of those. The graphic action, the graphic texture, this is a bit more complicated. We'll bring in some Photoshop so I can show you the actual graphic firstly. And we also need to go find the graphic, which should be in my assets here. I wonder why Photoshop, when you open it, it'll always bring it back up like this. It'll do that like three times. It's annoying because you can't do stuff in the background while it's opening. So the graphic is a 2K texture, 2048 by 3848. And this logo here, is, so the logo is just an image. And then I went and typed out this text myself. I went and found some fonts that were very similar and then just made all this stuff myself here as well. So you can see the strip as well, cut out and stuff like that. That's pretty much the graphic, fairly simple. Um, <clears throat> that's the graphic. The roughness is a bit complicated, so we'll start off with the bump map. 
by map is just some very very slight scratches um it's almost even too too much should be even lighter so you can see the scratch here so this should be even lighter than it is now um but i wanted some imperfections but i don't want it to be so harsh that the can would look bad so i just wanted to to look real but not so much that the can would look um horrible so this is even too much i should have lowered this even more but um that's pretty much all the types of scratches that i have on it just very very slight you'll barely notice them um but they're there. Okay, this roughness map, you can see there's quite a lot going on here. So I have a Zomax glossy material here. This is from Cornelius. Um, he has a website and he has a bunch of free textures on there. Really, really, these are my favorite roughness textures. Um, just because this one, especially, this one has some really nice mix of dirt and fingerprints and stuff. So if I go and plug this into the roughness channel here you'll sort of see what it does man okay that's not doing anything let's try oops let's try that one yeah so you can see i kind of have adjustments and stuff so let me turn this down to one you can see this is a really really nice mixture of fingerprints and dirt and stuff it's just a very very nice texture which can sort of stand on its own it's almost like a mix of different textures um in one so you don't have to go and mix them and stuff um yourself uh it's just a really really good high quality version here you can see it's a mix of like rough fingerprints and dirt and stuff like that it's a really really nice one one of my favorites in my phone in my phone video commercial thing um, which i did recently i use that for the circuit board it's a free texture so you can go find his website his name's cornelius and then you can go download it he's very popular in the 3d community so if you search hard enough on like art station stuff you'll find him so i'm just going to set this back so what i have here is so, so this is the start um this texture here which i use using as a base then I uh, set it to triplane mapping. If it was cubic, you would start to see seams. So the triplane mapping is to blend the two. It's basically to blend the two sides together so that there's no seams. Um, went for that. Mix that together with another texture um, using multiply mode. This is some drops going down. Um, and here you can start to see the drops starting to almost take effect here if we get the right angle here you can see there's some streaks going down like that so these these two textures are now working together um i thought this was a really nice mix of wetness and fingerprints and then i mix those together again with the multiply node and these are for the actual droplets that are falling down the can um but yeah i feel like i changed something because this texture is not looking the way it's supposed to this should be four that's my bad okay so now it's working a bit better so let me try and just plug this in again and see if this is more visible yeah so here you can see that we've got some droplets going down some streaks and stuff this looks very very real um and then just to add on top of that we have the actual droplets um for the actual we have the actual streaks for the actual droplets that go down here so here you can see there's um uh, street going down here so yeah that's pretty much it for that texture um and that's all for the texturing of the can so if i bring in everything you'll see how it all turns out and we also need to get rid of this hdri and then turn on the lighting uh, let's get a good angle like so so here you can see the actual streak for the droplet. So if I go and swap this out, you can see the streak for the droplets gone, but there are still some other streaks um, which have better detail and stuff like that in them. And then these are the custom streaks that added on for the droplets, which just add that extra bit of realism. Okay, so that's texturing. Uh, since we're already open this, we'll get into lighting now. Here you can see I've got 
couple of strange lighting setups going on here. Um, each scene slightly different, but for the most part, they're all lit, lit the same. Um, so we'll start off from the beginning. We've got uh, a left light here, which is basically just like a fill, or you can call this a rim light here. Um, very, very nice. Uh, I don't even know how to say it, like a very nice. Well, it's nice to separate the background a bit, but it's also like a nice sneak peek of the thing. You'll know in the scene here, this one I've basically got the setup going just duplicated on both sides. Um, that's why I got this very nice, almost like reveal going. And this is also at a very strange angle. You can see it's almost like behind this board here, but that's just what was working. And then I've got um, a BG spotlight, which is basically just to um, separate the can from the background. When you're working with a dark scene, you want to separate the product from the actual background um, so you can see the whole shape of it and stuff. And that's what that was doing. And then I've got a top light which is lighting the top here. You can see it's just adding a bit more definition to it. Then we've got our actual key light here, which is the main light, um, which is lighting up the whole of the can. So if we go turn on, turn off everything besides the key light, you can still see key lights doing a very good job of lighting up the whole thing. Then the rest just helps. So here we've got the left fill adding in there, just lighting up that area. Got the top light, just giving some light there then the BG spotlight, which will separate the whole actual product from the background. So yeah, I've been learning a lot from working for an advertising agency. It's been fun stuff. So that's lighting. Uh, it's fairly, it's fairly, uh, it's probably even exactly the same in all the scenes, to be honest. So that's pretty much it. Animation. Um, I don't even know where to start. Let's start with camera animation. So people have been complaining that my, I don't explain camera animation just because I think it's so simple. But if you take a look, you'll see the camera is pretty much just moving back. Um, all the camera animations are animated with splines here. So if we go take a look here, you'll see what we've got going. Like that. It's just splines that give it, um, doesn't make it feel so linear and static. Um, and then we also got the can rotating from 30 degrees to zero. Again, using splines to slow it down at the end, just much smoother this way, like so. And then droplets are animated using point level animation. So this that's also another reason why I combine them into one object. So here you can go into your points can press this button here and then you can actually animate the points here. So you can see that this drop, for example, is falling down. I tried to use this in real flow and then one of the guys I was working with said um, it looked like semen. So I decided to not do the real flow method and just do this method. <laughs> um, uh, so here you can see it's falling down. If I want it to fall up, I can just add a keyframe push it, push it up like that, add a keyframe, and now it's going up. So fairly basic. And then all around the can, well not all around the can, just this, just the areas that the camera was facing, I just selected, I was very careful with which drops were falling down, I just um, selected the ones I thought would be best, and just animated those. So a lot of the, a lot of the drops are just are oh, actually not moving, but maybe like six, six to eight or six to ten drops are animated it's fairly basic you just add a keyframe at the start go to the end just push them down add a keyframe and then you go and check and you just adjust them add a keyframe you go check and a couple of minutes later you have you've got animated drops and then you can just add that to the rest of your scenes and adjust them again that's pretty much it in terms of animation with those there is also a bit more animation which i guess we can should get into while we're on the topic animatic eight eight five and three well that's other stuff um eight <clears throat> 
So here we have uh, slightly different setups going on here. Um, sorry, I just need to let this thing load in. And I don't know if we're using this camera or not. I don't think we are. No, this is for a different scene, which I don't think we want. I guess I can delete it since the whole project's done anyway. Um, what's the best view for all of this? Let's go hide the floor. Cool. So here you can see, let's go get rid of these textures as well. You can see we've got a camera attached to a circle using spline path. And then we've got a target um, pointing at our target here. Um, so this target is in here. And then in this scene, we've we don't have anything moving but the actual camera. So literally just the position animated here. So if I go and show you the timeline, you can see what's going on with the actual curve to get that effect. So that's just pretty much that scene. Then there's Animatic 3, which is a bit more, it's a bit different. So same concept in terms of it just being sitting on an actual circle. Let's go get rid of the floor. Still sitting on the circle, still pointing at an actual target here, which is just a null. Um, but in this case, the circle is moving animated up and so is the actual target here, here you can see targets actually moving as well. So those are all controlled by splines as well. So here you can see there's quite a lot going on, or quite a bit going on in terms of splines, but not too much. Like so got some drops going down as well. And we'll get into the actual streaks <laughs> texture animation in a second. I just want to get through things one by one so I don't forget things. All right, so we've done modeling, we've done most of the animation, we still have real flow to do, we've done lighting, and we still need to do renders, settings and stuff. So I feel like I still haven't done some animation. No, most of it's covered. Animatic 5 is also the same concept of it just being on a circle and moving around, stuff like that. So, render settings. Let's do camera settings first. Well, we'll bring up the live viewer while we're doing that. So, here in the cases, originally I was doing all the motion blur and depth of field built in. But when I switched to 4K, um, I realized it would just take too long. So I decided to do depth of field and motion blur in post. I don't know why I switched to 4K. I just thought it'd be cool. Um, <laughs> my render times are going too fast. So I decided, hey, let me bump up the resolution and then they're going too slow. So I was like, hey, let me just do it in post instead. But it's one of those cases um, I've learned a lot in the past month about um, just being optimal in terms of time before I would render for like weeks um, just because I wanted it all to be 100% realistic and you end up just wasting so much unnecessary time. Um, you realize a lot of clients won't, real, won't know if your motion blur is inside of actual octane or if you just faked it in post. They honestly don't care. They just want it to look good and they want it to be delivered fast. So um that's what i did so in this scene because the render times are quick i did my actual depth of field inside of octane um f stop of eight aperture edge of two um and then got some post processing ticked on which isn't doing much and then here you can see i'm just going for some linear um exposure mm. uh yeah, so that's that. And then we've got some basic motion blur ticked on as well. Actual render settings here, path tracing, uh, I went for 8,000. That's because my um, adaptive sampling is on. Uh, diffuse of eight and speculative eight, I, I played around with this. 
and that's around where you stop seeing any differences um, just to save on the extra few seconds. Been very, very optimizational in terms of render times lately. The, so just a, an extra few seconds will really save you time when you're working with animation. So I realized eight and eight was just a good number that you don't see any scene changes. And Jack Clamp 100, path term power up to one. So from my understanding, what path term power does is it um, almost, if you like have a path that's going from like one centimeter to 10, and you turn this up to one, the path will almost cut off like, let's say around three centimeters. So the path won't go as far. Um, I'm, not, I don't even, I'm explaining this wrong, I'm sorry. But it just basically, it limits the amount of light bounces around your scene. Um, in some cases that can make it look worse, but in a lot of cases, even like in the case of this dark scene, you literally won't see any difference. But now you can see my run time is one gonna take, 57 seconds um and that's got all these light bouncing around and stuff but the scene's all dark so you don't need all this light bouncing around it's unnecessary so here it says 54 seconds we'll let it get to the end um just so we have an accurate representation we'll turn this up and then you can see so this basically just limits the amount of light bounces um, and you should go and check and you see, see if you can actually see a difference. If you can't, then you turn it up. Um, just save you some render time. So 53 seconds, store render buffer, turn this up and see how long this one takes. Could be the same, but I'm pretty sure it'll be faster. Um, 52 seconds. 46 seconds, just save 10 seconds there. 44 seconds. 43. Can you see a difference? Nope. So now we've just gone, I don't even remember what the previous time was, but we've just gone down to 42 seconds and we just sent, saved a ton of time um, for our final rendering um, process. Coherent ratio, when I'm testing my animations, I'll turn this up. In final, I'll have it down though, but this will speed up your render times even more when testing animation. Here you can see it's already dropping down to 47, 43, 41. So here we're saving quite a bit of render time already. Static noise is ticked on, just so we don't have some Noise dancing around. Parallel sample is up to 16 because I got a BV GPU. And then the adaptive sampling is what saves the day the most in terms of render times. So here you can see most of the scene isn't rendering because <laughs> we don't need it to, which is great. Uh, I, I did a tutorial on adaptive sampling and it was completely wrong. I do apologize about that. My information on it is still not very accurate, but I understand it a bit better. So. Your minimum samples is when your actual adaptive sampling ticks on um, and then your noise threshold is how much noise um, Octane will, uh, how much noise you're telling Octane is inside the scene. So Octane may think the scene is completely noisy, but if you visually can see there's no noise in it, you can say, hey, there's no noise in it. Um, lower the threshold, well, raise the threshold and just cut off the parts, cut off these areas in a way. Um, so here if I go 0.1, you'll see that the scene will turn off completely. Um, I'm going to turn green really quickly because you can octane that the whole scene is pretty much clean and it doesn't need to render a lot of it. So here instantly green. But if you go 0.01, you can tell Octane, hey, a lot of the scene is actually pretty noisy. Um, spend more time in rendering these areas and you'll see it, the green will turn on a lot slower. But yeah, this will save you a ton of render times because here you can see the background doesn't need any, any. Um, the background has no noise, so it doesn't need to be rendered. So you can um, adjust the threshold, um, make it turn on immediately. And now it's just gonna render, render, Background's already green. It's not going to render any of this. 90% um, of the scene is not actually rendering because it doesn't need to be rendered. All of this is already clean. Um, just save you a lot of render time. And that's pretty much it. So that's pretty much all my render settings. Um, 
except in the case when I'm not using built-in depth of field motion blur. When I'm exporting it and doing it in a post, I have a tiny bit different render settings here. So firstly, I've got my um, Z depth and motion vector passes going and then max samples 2000, that's pretty much it. And then my render settings are a bit different here. So here my actual samples can be lower because I don't, originally my samples are just to get the actual depth of fields to be, um, just to, to put more samples in the depth of field because that's where all the graininess was, but now I can lower them down because they don't need to be um, like that. And you can see this is rendering out real quick, 24 seconds in this preview here. Um, and then I've also adjusted my actual adaptive sampling and other settings to fit that. So if I go full screen this, at, this is 4K now. We can take a look at how long this would take. So adaptive sampling will only, now it's gonna say 26 minutes, adaptive sampling will only kick in at 64. And then you'll sort of see um, how this render time will start to drop. This is 4K, 4K frame right now, by the way. Um, I should probably have turned this down to 16. I don't know why it's on 64. But anyways, let's let this thing kick in a bit. Okay, so now the adaptive sampling should start kicking in. I do not know why this is taking so long. This only took a couple of minutes in my final render time. I don't know why it's taking so long, but I'll show you an example here. So you can see it's only really rendering out the drops. Um, it's pretty quick, um, pretty snappy, pretty fast, which is nice. Don't know what's going on with my live viewer here. See, here you can see this is a lot faster. Um, so, yeah, adapts to something I pretty much just use just to render, because I don't need to render the background, I don't need to render the can, but the depth of field was where all the graininess was, and I was just using it to isolate um, the grainy areas on the can here. So here you'll see, switches off everything, but where the depth of field is, is right there on the edge of the can, and that's where I'll focus all the rendering. The rest is green, which is what exactly what I wanted which meant I could bump this up to 8,000. But yeah, that's pretty much it in terms of render settings, camera settings we've done. I almost feel like we're getting close to finishing. Um, I guess people might ask what my lighting settings are. It's pretty simple. They're all the same power, it's just my yeah, I don't need to go into that. It's pretty basic. Um, the last scene is real flow. Fun stuff. So, oh, I forgot my drop animations. Sorry, let's cancel that. <laughs> uh, the best scene is actually animatic too. So this one, I almost forgot about that. So, Actual animation for the drops, if we, my face is getting sore. I got new SSDs lately and my actual, I had to reinstall everything. So my actual icons and stuff aren't showing. Do not know why, I'll need to fix that, but it keeps forgetting which programs need what to open. Okay, so these drops here, this is the same size of my actual graphic. So, um, what you do is you make a composition the same size of your graphic, then you go create a new solid, you create a mask, you go add the actual thing stroke, you add the effect stroke, it'll add a stroke on your, on your path. And then what you do is you, oh, sorry, you just go save as a PNG you go into um, your scene here and then you can go and drag it on like that and I can see, okay, so which scenes are being animated. 
that scene's dropping. So I want a line exactly on that. So you go back to After Effects, you shift your line a bit, you go save it as the exact same PNG, meaning you just replace it, you go here, um, it should refresh and then you can see, okay, now my line's on there. Now I need to animate it so that it's going on the drop. Now you go in here, you adjust your end and your start point, um, or basically just adjusting the end point. So you go to the front of the scene here, you go to the front of the scene here, and then you go save it, and then you'll see, okay, it's hitting exactly where the drop needs, where I need the drop. You go to the end of the scene here, go to the end of the scene here, then you add another keyframe, and then you can see, okay, now it's hitting, um, well, you need to move it down a bit using this endpoint here, and then you add a keyframe, then you go save it again, then you can see, okay, um, now it's hitting there, and now you'll know that the start and the end are hitting, um, which means you'll have an animation like this. Then you go save all these frames out, um, you import them as an actual texture here, turn on animation, you go just go, 50 for your end frame or however long your scene is. Um, turn on animate preview as well if you just want to actually see the preview of it in your actual viewport. Um, and then what I did is once that was all done, I went and multiplied it and added it into my actual octane here. So I have end frames and stuff like that. So my actual texture is being animated and being multiplied with my actual other textures as well. So then you'll get your um, effect of your actual drops um, making your can wet, which is a really nice, subtle, realistic effect that will add on to your actual object there. So what's going on here? Something strange is happening. Let's just go and close that and reopen it. Okay. Sorry about that. Don't know what was going on there. Hopefully it's fixed itself now. This HDRI needs to be turned off. And this lighter needs to be turned on. Cool. So. Yeah, so now you'll get the effect of your actual, your drops actually making your can wet, which is a very, very subtle, but nice realistic effect to add to your um, can there. So here you can see them going. And then here you can see where the C is. If I go to the end of the scene, you can see the drops and the actual streak is below the C now. Uh, very nice, subtle animation trick going there. So. Lastly is real flow. Let's go close the scene up. I used real flow for Cinema 4D here. Um, and I believe the cache I was using, this is my tutorial. I tried to do this tutorial before, as I told you, but let's go and bring in this one. So this is the cache that I used for the actual scene. You can see it's quite dense, a lot of stuff going on here. And then I can go skip and you'll see what's going on here. Cool. So I'm gonna try my best to break this down to you. If you've never used real flow before, uh, I'm sorry, you'll have no idea what's going on. But if you have basic understanding of it, then you'll kind of get an idea of what's going on. So we'll start off with actual objects and stuff in the scene. So what I've got going on is a cup which is where the liquids will be falling into. And then I also have a fill. So let's go sort of these. The fill is what the actual liquids will be emitted in. So the, the liquids basically fill up this can and then the can will, well, the liquids will fill up the space, the space will disappear. Then the liquids will just drop and then gravity and all the other um, air resistance and stuff will just do the rest. So uh, I literally have to do no animation at all. I'll just let um, actual simulations do the work for me. So the particles, as you'll see here, 
let's go to a new frame. Particles fill up in here like that. And then they just drop as gravity and all the other effects come in. And then they collide with the can and then they pop up. Sorry about that. I forgot to turn that off. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's pretty much it in terms of objects. For our object tags here, we've got um, a collider tag and a real flow volume tag. And our collider is basically, obviously, there to help our particles collide. And this particle geometry should be showing, but it's not, it's not. So a collision distance is just to help the particles collide correctly, the space between the actual object and the particles. That's pretty much all I changed here. And then our volume tag is just to collect control the quality of the actual geometry. So if this is low quality, you'll have holes in your geometry and particles will be falling through. But this, if this is high quality, um, particles won't be going through the actual object and they'll be colliding correctly. So that's the objects out the way. We can get into the actual particles now. So fluid, we're going for liquid SPH. That's the most accurate one, which is a uh, so that's why I went for it. Resolution 10,000, it's real world scale. So that was good enough. Well, I actually think it's 10 times the real world scale, but that was the resolution that was um, sufficient for it. And then for my scene, I'm going, for, I'm using my GPU for the actual simulations. Time scales turned on by a lot, just to get that slow motion liquid. And then I'm obviously caching this all onto SSD. So it's quite fast. Um, my emitter, as I said before, is just filling up an actual space like this, and then gravity does the rest. So, yeah, so I've got quite a few demons going on, which is basically just what's affecting the scene, um, different forces affecting the scene. So the gravity, self-explanatory, particles fall down. Like gravity then there's the drag the drag is like air resistance basically so um yeah you know, just basic air resistance um we've got 2k volumes going on why is nothing showing okay sorry okay got 2k volumes going on so the first one Oh, that's why. The first one is the large K, the scene K volume, which basically kills any particles that fall out the scene here. So let's say it splashed and particles fell down there. I wouldn't want it to be calculating into nothingness all the way down there. So um, if it goes, if it basically hits the floor, it'll kill all the particles because we're not going to see that stuff. Um, so that was the first one. And then the second one was this one, which you'll see here. So here you'll see uh, 74 frames. There's a bunch of particles in the scene. 75, half the particles are deleted. So I've got another K volume going on inside here. Inside here. I don't know why it's not. What is this? Sorry, I don't know what this box thing is. Oh, that's the noise field. No, okay. Nobody knows. Anyway, <laughs> we've got a K volume, um, which basically kills all the particles inside this box here. Um, and this is where my actual scene starts for animation. So I didn't want to have to render out all these particles down here when you're not going to see it. This is what the camera sees. You don't need all this thousands of particles and meshes and stuff going on down there which is why I cut it off as soon as the actual animation starts. So this actual animation starts at say frame 75 and then goes to frame 121. Then we've got a noise field. Our noise field is basically just, you'll see here, 
and I went and cashed out another lower quality simulation for the tutorial. Um, let me switch out these caches here. You'll see here as the particles come down, you can see that they almost zigzag and wave slightly as they're dropping and that's what the noise field is doing. It's adding some variation and that slight subtle variation is what made them instead of splashing out all evenly in all directions, they almost come out like that. And I saw this in a Coke commercial and I was like, that looks cool, I need to copy that. So I went for that effect and whoosh, they all splash up like that. The Sheeta Demon is um, stopping my particles or my mesh from having a bunch of holes in them. So whenever there's a hole there, it'll insert a particle there and fill up all the holes. So I don't know if you can even see it, but sometimes you'll see some particles popping up out of nowhere. And that's just basically the Sheeta Demon filling up all the, all the holes and so that we have a very smooth, very nice looking mesh, even if it's thin. Um, and yeah. Then we've got our mesh. Mesh is fairly high poly, poly counts, as you can see, extremely high detail. Um, <laughs> it's quite intense actually. <laughs> but that's why I had to cut half of it out because um, just wasting render time and RAM and stuff like that. But here you can see very, very high detail. And I wasn't very, I wasn't careless about this. Um, I played around this a lot and I just realized that this was the best um, quality for the best um, performance, which is why I also did all the motion blur and depth of field and stuff in post. Um, so it actually wasn't bad when I did all that stuff in post. And I also had a bit of time to render it out. So yeah, very, very high quality going on there. But just went for medium resolution, turned on the radius, a bit of smoothing and a bit of thinning and some relaxation. That's pretty much it. <laughs> And then here for my depth of field, I went and um, put my velocities inside of my speeds here, um, which is what you'll get here for your mesh. And then you'll get accurate um, motion blur inside your camera tag here. And I think that's all in terms of real flow. I'm just having another thing. Ooh, lighting. Pick a camera that doesn't have depth of field because that will really slow this thing down. Okay, so I did forget about lighting. Uh, let me just go back to our original cache here so we can get some nice updated frames going. Lighting is quite... It's quite random actually. I just inserted some lights and dragged them around until it looked fine um, and shiny. And that's pretty much all I did. It wasn't anything thought out and like I wasn't thinking, oh, three point lighting or anything crazy like that. Just like light the scene. I don't even know why I'm showing you this because there's literally nothing going on here. Um, but if this thing goes gray again, I'm just going to move on because this is actually wasting time. Yeah, that's wasting time. I don't know why it's doing that and I don't feel like fixing it. So that's pretty much it. Then once you've gone and rendered out all your scenes, insert all your, I render them out as TIFF files at 25 FPS. I've been working at 25 FPS recently just because uh, agency has been broadcasting at 25 FPS and it's also a lot easier to count than 24 FPS. Um, Two seconds is 50, three seconds is 75. It's a lot easier to count that way. So they're all rendered out as 4K TIFF files. The reason why I went for TIFF files is just so I can have as much information in them as possible, 32 bits, um, which is what I wanted. And yeah, then you get your multi-pass, which you can just go right click. You can just go you use extractor, extractor. And then you can also, then I also went and used some levels just to adjust the actual depth map so that we get um, something a bit more accurate in my eyes in terms of what I wanted for the depth maps. And then I went and used Frischlath depth of field, uh, added some radius, picked the composition, uh, inverted the depth buffer, and then picked the actual focal point. That's pretty much it. So if we go 
you know, I'll turn all these on at once. But then we've got our motion blur going. Um, just real smart motion blur. I let it guess in this case. In this case, a lot of cases I actually didn't use the motion vector part, so I just let it guess it was good enough. Then we've got some noise and the noise here, you'll see that there's some fringing going on in the background. So I'm gonna point this out, pointed this out in my phone tutorial. Um, not my phone tutorial, my phone commercial. I didn't actually see it in that one, but in this one I did and I was like, ooh, that's what he was talking about. Um, so I Googled it, did some research and a lot of people just said, um, recommended what he recommended, add a tiny bit of noise and they'll go away. Um, so I did that and you'll see noise has got, um, see that that fringing has gone um, and that slight bit of noise really helps in all the scenes. So now if I go and turn on everything, it is quite slow in terms of updating your viewport, but it's a lot faster than running it all out in Octane. So yeah, in my opinion, the depth field looks so much better in post um, just because there's none of that grain, um, but it can sometimes be inaccurate and can sometimes be a bit annoying. But other than that, um, it looks really good and especially clients and stuff, they are, they won't notice a difference. So yeah, in a scene like this, you'll, you'll actually start to see the effect of the depth of field. I had some scenes that really like, that really had some nice uh, depth of field going. They never made it up, made it into the final. Haven't done any color correction. It does have a bit of a green tint, which I'm not too happy about, but What's done is done. I probably should have added some contrast to the scene, stuff like that, but it's good enough. Um, you just have, it was a portfolio piece. So I just need to show people that I can do the stuff. Um, and it, my portfolio is long outdated. Um, there should be work up there that's 10 times better. So I thought I would turn on something in a couple of days just to show any potential new clients that, hey, um, this is a level of quality I'm able to produce. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the whole tutorial, really. I'm just waiting for this last bit of depth of field. You see how long it takes now, but it's also a lot faster. For very crisp, clean render, it's a lot faster than doing it in Octane. So, and it's also 4K, so <laughs> that might be what's causing it. Um, yeah, it should be here in any second. And then we'll finish up with the tutorial. Uh, if you want to download this project, Arthur, well, patreon.com slash Arthur Whitehead, uh, you can get the project there. Follow me on Instagram.com slash Arthur Visuals as well. Subscribe if you like the video. Uh, I'm not sure when my next one will be. I've been very busy with work recently, but I've got a, quite a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Um, I do share quite a little bit of it on Instagram, but face, but YouTube, sorry. It's a bit of a different story. It's a lot more effort to put into. Um, but yeah, you know, this is taking really long. Let's go change this to third. And then you'll see the depth of field. Usually I just render out a preview in Premiere Pro. And because I'm not trying to go for full 4K resolution in Premiere Pro, because the box is so small, um, it's a lot quicker. So here you can see the motion blur and then the depth of field as well in the background working together. Depth of field, depth of field, motion blur. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you so much for the support once again. Um, let's just show you this last scene, animatic one. Just so you have one more reference of what it looks like in post. So here we have our um, 4K footage. Then we have our post processing. If we could turn on post processing, which is basically just glow. Then we have depth of field. Let's turn this to third as well. So we've got our depth of field, which should kick on quite quickly. This looks like illustrator vector animation going on here. <laughs> depth of field, motion blur. Oh, that was quite slow, but please bear with my computer. I'm getting a new CPU soon, which is exciting. I'm getting a new CPU, new motherboard, new RAM, and then I'm adding a GPU as well. Oh, I can't wait. Okay, and then we've got some 
contrast and brightness and then just the noise to top it off to get rid of any fringing hope you guys enjoyed had a great day uh have a great day see you on my next video and goodbye